stop sailing ad hoc. A sentence that meant a lot to me all along the way, knowing that I was sailing for a really long period, and I don't mean in a boat. I mean that all the time there was change, and all the time I needed to understand everything around me so I would know how to move forward. One of the few things that I've learned that helped me move forward much faster, much more steady, was the system. Um, we're in 2016, everything became digital. People involved in development are the easiest people to sell to the idea that you can change the world. Examples are already there. You got Steve Jobs, you got Facebook out there, you got Google out there, you got computers in your hands, you got mobile devices, you can actually navigate the whole world in five seconds in your hand. That's why I'm here to tell you, change the world that can be done if you know how to. Guide your focus in the right direction. You guide your focus in the right direction. You can help lead people around you in the right direction and you are changing the world already. Um, a little background about me, just for you to know where I come from. I'm not gonna talk much about it. Uh, I just started from IT security background, really young, 14, age 14 to age 16. Uh, then I moved, mostly my focus was social engineering. At th That was the part that intrigued me the most. I definitely got involved much more on the technical level. Um, age 16 till age 19, uh, 19 till 22, my focus was still technical. 19 till 22, I became IT manager in my university. The technical guy, who's really good on the technical level, but has no clue what management is, managing a team of volunteers, university students, you learn how important it is to know how to focus, how to control your own mind, lead your mind in the right direction, so you can lead others around you. Regardless how many management tricks you're gonna learn, if you don't know how to manage your own mental state, useless. It becomes manipulation if you don't know how to manage yourself first. Um, at a later stage, I moved much more towards psychology and management. Um, at the moment, I'm much more in management. <coughs> I'm a operations manager in Visma, Visma Labs, and meditation guide and coach. Um, I couldn't thank Alberts enough for the very beautiful talk that he, he made there to establish the importance of focusing on your own mind, going inside yourself to know how to move forward to the outside. Now, let's make a very small experiment. Who's with me here? Hands up. Perfect. Right hand up, please. Now, your right hand let it lean on the right, put it on the shoulder of the person next to you. <laughs> do that. Cheater. Do it, do it. Now, smell that. <laughs> and tell me what do you smell? <laughs> Anybody? Perfect. Very big possibility what you're smelling is nothing. <laughs> or one of those brands. Those are the most selling brands in Latvia. Now let's switch because we're not doing advertising here. The main concept behind what I'm saying is, in terms of hygiene, we've developed so much. If you've tried this a hundred years ago, it could be a mortal mistake. We didn't shower every day, right? Now we shower every day. This is a huge progress. We might think of it as, yeah, that's fine, I just shower every day. But that's not true. A hundred years ago, that was not the norm. But we've developed on a hygiene level. Um, years of machine development, most of you are developers or work in development. You look at the system in front of you, you see your code, or you start writing your code and you start seeing the result, you know how it works. The thing that doesn't work the same way, most of the cases about self-development, is that we don't have a software development team. Right? You don't have your SDK in front of you, you don't know where to write your code, you don't know how to read your code, and all that stuff. Concrete beats abstract, that's why we put so much focus on abstract, uh, sorry, on concrete things, and we let go of the abstract. 
it's time, I think, to start moving to concrete. I'll start with the first uh, takeaway. I'll make it simple. There will be a lot of takeaways along the way. Uh, some of them are super easy. Some of them would take some discipline. You can choose which ones to take, which ones to let go of for now. Along the way, if you feel you got the time for it, start doing it. First one is take three minutes every day to close your eyes, breathe, and just be yourself. Do nothing. Try it for a second. Close your eyes. Eyes closed. Take a deep breath. Perfect. Just notice your breath. Feel your breath going in through your nose, through your throat, all the way to your lungs, and back out. You can open your eyes for now. Just for the fact that you can manage to do that. You can do it for one minute, you can do it for five seconds, you definitely can do it for three minutes. Three minutes are not too much. You take possibly 10, 15 minutes to take your shower. Some take more, I don't know. But for us guys, usually it's not more than that. So you can take three minutes to take a mental shower if you want to in the morning. Wake up, take your shower, get dressed, sit there, three minutes, just close your eyes, focus on your breath. It's as simple as that. It can develop into something much more complex along the way. It's up to you how far you want to take it. But this is the basic exercise. What this will do is it will allow you to feel that calmness you feel in the morning and associate it with your breath, with just focusing on your breath. How can this be used at a later point? There is no place in the world where you cannot breathe, right? Otherwise, you'd be dead. So if you're in a meeting and you're crazy stressed, all you will need to do if you're doing this exercise is just close your eyes. Well, you cannot close your eyes in that meeting. Just take a breath and focus on your breath. Notice how your breath is happening in your body. It will take your mind off of the immediate challenge that you're facing. It will take your mind off of that cortisol that's in your body. We're going to talk a little bit about cortisol. And it will make you feel calm. Cortisol is that feeling of poisoning in your blood. That's the feeling where your hands are trembling or your hands are getting sweaty. Or suddenly you want to talk to someone, you want to say, how are you today? And you go like, how are you today? <laughs> that's, that's it. Or you want to tell them, how did, you do, how did you do that? That's cortisol in your blood. How do you control that? Very simple exercise. You don't have to close your eyes in that meeting. You could simply notice your breath. It will calm you down. Just start with that exercise. A very simple exercise to start. <coughs> so, mental imagery, that's your SDK. It can be in many forms. Guided meditation, possibly with a guru or with a coach. It can be just meditation. It can be your manager who's helping you with that. Every now and then helping you, giving you tips and tricks, how to focus on those things. Or it could be self-hypnosis. You could learn self-hypnosis. It helps you also. Self-hypnosis is nothing but a scientific term for meditation. The content you add it later. Or just close your eyes. As simple as this. Now, if you're a developer, you've worked with your system, you know that basically if you're working with assembly, you need to know your hardware. You need to know your, the system you're working with. You need to know the operating system you're developing for. Unless if you're developing web, you need to know the operating system of the server. Or Java, it's a different story. But in general, <laughs> you need to know the system you're working with. If you don't need to know the hardware, at least you need to know the system you're implementing your solution on. That system that we're talking about here is you. It's your brain, your body. What I want to tell you now is, for this talk, I want you to feel like you are in the driver's seat. So if at any point in time, when I'm moving through the technical details, you feel like you want me to stop, you want to ask a question about something, please do. Even if your question is going to take the rest of the conversation, we're going to do that. Because that's what's important. What you go away with after the talk. So at any point in time, you want me to slow down, go faster, higher my voice, lower my voice, whatever you want to. You're driving. That's the feeling I want you to have in your brain as you're driving later.
Okay, we're gonna start with a very basic element, which is your thoughts. How your thoughts develop, and what are the thoughts? The basic elements. The very basic element in our body is a thought. Footage that you're gonna see here is taken from a movie called What the Bleep Do We Know? You can feel free to download the movie, really interesting movie to watch. So what you can see here is the brain. The neurons in the brain are actually responsible for the thoughts. And those are neurons, they have multiple arms, and wherever one arm of the neuron connects with another, that's where you have a thought. This is how we work by association. Those thoughts can be images, they can be audio, or they can be a feeling. Temperature, taste, kinesthetic. Okay, those are stand this is the main concept of a thought, and this is how the brain registers it. Yes, it's important to do all those meditation and all those things that we do, but why, how does it work in the brain? Anybody under age, close your eyes. No, no, there's nothing major. Uh, thoughts are those connections, as we mentioned. Memories are actually made out of multiple thoughts. So whenever multiple thoughts come together, this is a memory, this is how you make a memory. A memory of something that happened with you in the office is a series of thoughts that could fire together in your brain. Now, one more thing to know is what do we learn from thoughts and memories? Memories in our brain compose our learning and they help us learn behaviors. So technically, your colleague walked into, walked into the office, this specific colleague that you don't like much, he walks into the office and he starts talking to you at the first time in a very aggressive tone. You feel bad about it. It triggers bad feelings in you. Next time that colleague walks in, does the same. Third time that colleague walks through the door, you're on fire. Or somebody else walks in the office that looks like that colleague. Doesn't have to be that colleague. Has traits that are similar. Your subconscious mind immediately will want to protect you it will start firing up those same emotions because back in the days when we were running away from lions, anything that looks like a lion, you don't need to think, run. <laughs> That's exactly what we're talking about. Those are things that are hardwired in our brains, but the behavior is hardwired. The, the, if you want to, the, the, the frame is hardwired. How we learn is hardwired. Fear of a lion had become hardwired in us to a certain point. Fear from a colleague who's got a beard, not true, it's not hardwired, it's something you can change. Uh, your other colleague who walks into the office every now and then, sits and talks to you, and you feel super good with her, you know that colleague. Anybody has that colleague, knows her? Perfect. That colleague, when she walks into the office, everything works perfectly fine, right? Suddenly, when she leaves your office, the bug that you were working on suddenly is much easier to solve. Um, you've had a fight at home before you came to the office or with your boss. She walks into the office and suddenly you feel good. That's the same. This is association. This is how we learn things. Now, what's important is, yes, we can learn things, and it's important to keep on learning, but also it's important to be able to unlearn. You want to unlearn bad behaviors. How do we do that? The same way neurons that fire together, wire together, they become a pattern, a hardwired pattern. If you don't fire them together anymore for a while, they will unwire. But that's a long process, right? Uh, fire that colleague until you, so you don't see them anymore, so you calm down? Not, not a good idea. Uh, leave the job? Also not a good idea. The best thing to do is when this pattern starts to fire up, when this lack of confidence starts to fire up, when that colleague walks in, stop, take a deep breath, and notice your breath. You will immediately calm down the tone, calm down those emotions. What you're actually doing is you're triggering back. That feeling you felt in the morning when you were totally calm and taking your deep breath, you're triggering it in that moment 
where you are actually so fired up emotionally to the point where you cannot communicate in a normal way. This is called a pattern interrupt. This is one of the very simple tools that can be used uh, to help in those behaviors. Those tools, you can find a lot of them uh, in one of the, uh, the, I would call it a technology. It's a school of thought, it's called NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. You can find them in most psychology related disciplines. There's a lot of tools they can be developed on. This is one of them. So every week, list one thing that you need to unlearn. Notice when it's happening and sit and help yourself unlearn it. Put triggers to remind you how to unlearn it. Possibly when that colleague walks in the office, that really angry guy who keeps on screaming at you, uh, sit at home, imagine him walking in with a big red nose, clown shoes, those baggy pants, and play the music if you want to even with it. What you're actually doing is you're rewiring that. Some people walk in my office and they are clowns sometimes. In the past, I used to do that. <laughs> I've had a manager back in the past that used to get me on that bad note and I didn't want to be on that bad note. What did I do? The clown walked in and I'm smiling and he's screaming and I'm smiling and he has no clue what's happening there. But what's really happening there is I'm still calm, I'm composed, he finishes screaming about a thing I know exactly what I need to understand from that thing. And I repeat it to him with a positive intent. So you do believe that when we're taking those calls, we're not taking them right? Perfect. How can we do it better? You can't do that if the only thing you're thinking of, oh my God, he's going to bite me now. <laughs> he's not the lion. Now, this is something in your brain. It doesn't look very cool, but it actually does a very cool job. It's called the hypothalamus. What the hypothalamus does is it creates certain polypeptides or hormones, if you want to, a form of proteins. There's so many proteins and different types of uh, uh, con uh, combinations that would end up in different types of hormones. And those hormones, what they do is they travel through the veins and through the nerves to the body, either with the blood or in the nervous system. And they reach cells. Now there's different types of them. There was some greens, some red, some, this is just a representation for them. They're not really like this, but this is conceptually what it looks like. Now, what those do is they travel in the blood. <coughs> when they travel in the blood, they reach certain cells. Each hormone has different effect on multiple cells. So this old guy here sees this view. You can imagine what hormones start firing from his brain. They go to certain cells, they make the heart beat faster. They don't make him sweat because that's not fear here. Uh, they reach different cells in the body and they cause different behaviors for those cells. This works in most hormones in our body. Okay, so every day find one behavior and try to look into the mechanism that triggers it. Any behavior that's happening with you in the office, not definitely you, it could be some friend who walks in, talks in a different way. Uh, it could be a colleague that walks in, talks in a specific way that has a different effect on you. Instead of looking into the content of what they're saying immediately, sometimes just let yourself Notice what's triggering that. Let yourself understand the mechanism behind it. You'll start to notice that every time you're saying that specific word, this person is going ballistic. What's really happening? There's a piece of code in their brain that has a trigger, and that trigger is that word you're saying. You don't mean it, you didn't do anything wrong, but they have that word hardwired to this behavior. When you start noticing it, you know how to work with it. I'm not saying don't use that word. Maybe you want to use it sometimes. But just start noticing it. Now, one of the hormones is endorphin. Endorphin is that hormone that's responsible for numbing the pain. That's the hormone that actually 
makes you want to go train every day and swim. That's the hormone that makes you get that six pack you want. Any gym fans here? Gym? Okay. <laughs> Nobody wants to show the six pack. That's fine. <laughs> okay. So on your way to save the world, what you really need is those endorphins firing in. That's the hormone when you're going hunting at a certain day. You start feeling that, well, back in the days when we were hunting, you're walking towards that prey that you want to hunt, and you keep on following it, following it. For the vegetarians, imagine going after an apple tree. You're very hungry, <laughs> you're going towards an apple tree. Your, your muscles are getting tired. Uh, you've picked up all the apples you want to take with you, right? And you're taking them back to the cave to help the people in the cave to eat the, the apples with you. Uh, you're getting tired, your muscles are getting uh, in pain. What do you do? Endorphins fire in your body. They keep you going. And this is what makes you the next morning wake up going hunting today? <laughs> this is what's happening with us. Now, pick up one hard task every day, sorry, every week, and do it. Pick up that one development piece of code that everybody was leaving behind because it's hard and do it. Don't wait for the boss to know that. You're gonna get your reward inside. That's what you feel after an overnight at work. I'm not promoting overtime. Don't do much overtime. It's not good for you for other purposes. Uh, watch out from, from, from endorphins. They're actually addictive. And they're the selfish kinds of hormones. Another thing is dopamine, another hormone in the body. That's what makes our friend here look at his prey and keep following his prey for a really, really long time and keep going. The prey is really far, the apple tree is, is far. You're walking in, you see that apple tree in the distance, and you're like, hmm, feels good. You walk a bit closer, the apple tree becomes closer, what happened? Boom, another shot of dopamine. This is what dopamine does. This is the checklist. Uh, this is when you write a checklist. In some, some situations, you're writing a certain checklist uh, for what you're going to do today. Uh, sometimes with me and many people I've heard from before, uh, they'd be writing a checklist, doing things during their day, and then suddenly a new task shows up. What do I do? Write it on the checklist. Do it. Scratch it off. Even if I forgot to write it, I'll go do the task, and then after that, I'll write it and scratch it off. Why? I want my dopamine shot, come on. That's what I'm working for. This is how our body functions. So do keep a checklist, it will help you. Now the other thing that's very important to note about dopamine, it's the most addictive hormone you can ever imagine. This is the beep in the car on the phone that says, are you going to the party next week? But you heard that beep. You cannot wait, you just want to pick up that phone, look at it, sometimes even answer it in the middle of the road while you're driving. Why is that? You want your dopamine. So what's out from this? This is what keeps you doing overtime for a really long time till the point where you've exhausted yourself, where you come back the next day to the office and you're on those hormones and you're like all the day psyched up, psyched up, psyched up. It's like taking drugs, literally like taking drugs. This is what boosts drug addiction, alcohol addiction, and most addiction. It's dopamine. So it is good from a certain perspective. It keeps us going. But watch out from it. It could become an addiction, and it could move you to the point where you're destroying yourself in a way or another. So take three minutes in the morning, make a checklist, check, th check things out as soon as they're done. Dopamine works better fresh. Consume it when it's ready. So whenever you're done with the task, scratch it off. Those two seconds where you're gonna stop, open that Trello board or whatever checklist you're using, and select that task as done, <coughs> it's perfect. Those two seconds, you're not gonna save the world in them. Well, actually, you're saving the world by checking that one off, by keeping yourself going. So do keep a checklist. Serotonin. Why do I have this gentleman here? This is the alpha male. Serotonin is this hormone that helps us put together a social behavior. 
what, are, what am I talking about with those social behaviors? A social behavior is where you are walking into a room and you feel nervous because you're meeting someone. They're the alpha male, you're not the alpha male. Or female if you want to, it's the same. It works all the same. If, you're, if somebody walks into that room and they want to talk to you and the only thing you can see in their eyes is fear, you're the alpha male. Now, how do you deal with that? That's a different thing. Now, why is serotonin important in our life? What serotonin does is it regulates the behavior. If you're in an office and you're doing your job and everything is really good, but suddenly uh, the CEO walks into the office and you look at them and you're like, what are you doing here? That's not going to be good. Okay. <laughs> now, why is that something that's hardwired in us? Back in the days when we were still hunting, or when we were still living in caves and tribes, what really mattered at that point was that the alpha male is actually, or the alpha female in our society nowadays, as you can see her here, you'll see her more often in our work environments, especially in the Nordics. Um, what really happens there is you need the alpha male, the stronger individual, to be throwing themselves in front of the danger to protect everybody around them. This is the hormone of leadership. 300, a movie, who watched 300? Perfect, that's good, you'll understand what I'm talking about. What's the most important thing for them? The shield, your shield. You either bring it with you or you come on it. That's 300, not me. But what I'm talking about here is leadership is actually protecting the person next to you. Leadership is actually about protection. It's not about anything other than protection. Now, what you can do here is actually, you're protecting others around you. You're leading and keeping your group safe. You get something back from that, right? That's serotonin. What serotonin does is it makes that colleague next to you totally fine with you getting a higher salary, right? Anybody here has an issue with their boss getting a higher salary? Okay, anybody here has an issue with their boss getting a higher salary and whenever there's something dangerous, you get thrown in front of it? <laughs> exactly. Why? Because they're breaking a social code. <coughs> if you're getting the higher salary, if you're getting the better car, if you're getting the better suit, if you're getting the better whatever, if you're the architect in my team, I want to expect from you that whenever there is danger, you'll keep my back. I'll protect you when you're not seeing, but if there is danger, I'll expect you to be there taking care of it. In development, this could be that really hard issue that you cannot solve on your own. You know who you go talk to. Uh, the leader, the alpha male, is not always the person higher in a hierarchy. In most organizations nowadays, specifically, let's say, in Bisma, it's no more a hierarchical organization. It's a flat organization. It's not the formal authority that plays the role. It's actually the actual authority. The person in your team who knows better, who can help you better, that's the person who's got the authority. No one in a meeting room is more important than the best interest of the organization. Why? Because the organization is what's keeping everybody safe and moving forward. Oxytocin, all the fuzzies, unicorns, hugs and kisses, my team, that's oxytocin. Um, oxytocin is this hormone you feel when you shake hands with someone. That's really something that happens. If you're, in, if you're signing a contract with someone and that individual doesn't shake hands, you just sign the contract, everything's fine, we're shaking hands, right? And that person, what does he do? You're shaking hands and he goes, I don't want to shake hands. What? What do you mean? We just signed the contract. Let's shake hands. No. What you, what's really going to happen is either you're going to break that contract or not start that contract from the beginning, take that paper back, give me back my signature, or you're going to walk into that contract with your hand on your heart, totally scared of it. Why? You didn't oxytocin on it. 
this is where you're doing something good. Let's say an example, you're walking on the street, a guy in front of you is carrying a bunch of papers in his hands, a couple of paper, papers fell off. You go down, pick them up, and go give them to that person. Why? I know you're nice and all, but what is it on a biological level? Oxytocin. It makes you feel good when you do something good. What else happens? You give those papers to him, he looks at you, thank you. Oxytocin, that big smile on his face, that is oxytocin. One more thing, that guy standing on the side who saw you give him the papers, he looks at you and he's like, I saw what you've done there. <laughs> oxytocin. It regulates social behavior. This is teamwork on a biology level. This is what we're, when everybody's saying teamwork, leadership, and we're thinking there's something very fuzzy in the air, we don't know what it is, that is what it is. Note one daily act of kindness. Every day, write down an act of kindness. Make an Excel sheet you write them on, or a small notebook you write them on. Every day, write one. Just noticing it, just writing it down, is gonna make you notice it more. Noticing it is gonna make you get that dose. Not really for the dose, forget about that dose. Think how better you can work with your team. Think how amazing your team is gonna feel knowing that you got their back. Think how amazing you feel if you know your colleague that's sitting right next to you has your back. Stress. Cortisol. That's when you're, when you're sitting right there in the office in front of your computer. That message pops up. Or that guy walks in. Or you're preparing that presentation to walk into the office and give to... Whoever that is that last time kicked your ass because of it. You get sweaty, your heart beats faster, you get tense, your hands shake. What are your hands shaking? This is energy being pumped into your muscles. This is sugar being pumped into your muscles to get them ready to run because the lion's behind you. Now, one other thing that happens when the lion's behind you your growth organs stop. You don't need your nails to grow when the lion's running behind you. You don't need your nails. Your hair, you don't care. You want to stay alive. What else stops when you got oxygen, when, sorry, when you got cortisol in your body? Your immune system stops. I'm sorry, your flu has to wait. The lion's behind you, right? That's fine if the lion's really behind you. That's fine if you're driving a motorcycle and a car driving fast towards you when you need to react fast. Your subconscious mind is doing this for a good, for a good purpose, to save you from certain situations. If the tram is going straight at you, you need to jump. You need those muscles pushing you to jump. If you're in the office and somebody's telling you you've done this wrong, you don't need to jump. You don't need to scream. You don't need to get angry. As a matter of fact, you need to calm down and focus on the feedback you're getting. How do you do that? Anybody knows how do you do that? Breathe. Exactly. Just breathe. That's the first thing to start with. Much more can be done, definitely. There's so many techniques. We can go into their details at a later point. You can reach out to me at any point. We can go into the details of those. You can look on the internet. There's so many details about what are the techniques you can do. Even in certain scenarios, it's a phobia, and it's hardwired. And you cannot really deal with it. You need help from somebody to help you unwire it in your brain. There are tools to do that. Now, another thing about stress yet that you need to know is stress is good in a situation of danger, but in the situation where you're in the office, constantly stressed, what you're doing is you're stopping your immune system. Stopping your immune system for long periods of time causes you to get sick more often. Anybody had a colleague in the office who was under pressure and suddenly got sick? Yeah, for sure. Cortisol. Uh, any, at some point when you go to the office and constantly you're working in a work environment that's really negative, that's really pushing you to your limits, that's really getting you negative all day long. At some point, you're gonna go home, your nerves are broken down, you're so worn out to the point where when you're 
girlfriend, wife, uh, friend, uh, uh, kids try to talk to you, you're aggressive with them. Don't talk to me. I cannot focus now. And then we get to the point where this becomes the norm. The moment you feel you're in a workplace and you're constantly angry or constantly stressed out, it's time to move. Or it's time to realize what's happening wrong, what you're doing wrong. What cycle do you need to break? Maybe it's not the employment. Maybe it's a behavior that you're doing that's causing that stress. It's time to stop that behavior and start looking what's behind it, what's causing that. Now, another thing that's very important, when you feel symptoms of stress, stop, notice, acknowledge, let go and breathe. So when you feel stress, don't let it accumulate and develop, stop. Notice what's happening. Take all the emotional luggage that it takes with, leave it behind. That's what I mean by acknowledge it and let it go. That thought that you're stressing about is not good for you. It's not going to help you in any way. Let it go and focus on the problem itself and how you can solve it. Your emotions will not help you solve it better. The other thing that I want to tell you is not what, one act of kindness per week that you will reward in gratitude. A friend who's done something good, be grateful. Also, what we're talking about here is oxytocin. Oxytocin and serotonin, what they do is they block cortisol. They prohibit cortisol in the blood. So acts of kindness will save you from that nervous behavior in the workplace. Being nice to people around you will change that workplace, will make it much better. You have the power to change the world. You have the power to change the development scene. You have the power to change your mind. Simply by the power you were given to change your focus. Take your focus off of the emotions at that point. Put your focus on what matters. On that work colleague that's next to you that needs your help at this point. Or on that colleague that can help you at this point. Put your focus on what matters in life. Finally, you know what I'm going to say next, right? You're more than welcome. Thank you. So, how do you practice that in Wisma? How do I practice that in Wisma? No, not you personally, but the company as a Wisma down to the development teams. Okay. I'll well, give you simple examples. I'm not going to give you something that's like a huge plan to control how the system works. Nobody does that. What I'm going to tell you is certain things that we do on a daily basis. I personally make sure that I don't come to the office with an angry face. I make sure that I don't come to the office stressed out. Every individual in Visma gets two days that he can work from home of his choice. In case you woke up this morning that you're feeling bad about it, you don't want to come to the office, you stay at home, you work from home, you come back the next day to the office with a happy face. Another thing, we try to keep things simple. We try to not allow aggravation to take place. And we try to spread those kinds of, uh, this kind of knowledge. Because when I'm putting that kind of knowledge in the office with my colleagues, most of them here, uh, what's really happening is they can come and put me at check on. Roland, you said that. Why are you behaving differently? And to be honest, I think it's a privilege to be in a position in Visma that allows me to practice what I'm preaching. And that's something I really thank my management for. The awareness about this stuff really helps. We try to promote as much as possible teamwork. We try as much as possible to have teamwork, uh, uh, to have uh, team building activities. Uh, we go play beach volleyball, no more now, right now because it's cold. We go do karting, we go, uh, uh, we have parties at the office sometimes every Friday when there's birthdays. We sit and watch their talks sometimes and discuss plenty of things. Any other ideas? Somebody? Visma. <laughs> Fika. 
we've just copied a Swedish uh, uh, tradition teacup. You just go to, you could go to the kitchen anytime you want to with your colleagues. We got bread, you toast your bread, you use peanut butter, it's my favorite. There's jam also, but peanut butter is my favorite, to be honest, fruits, stuff like that. Those small things that make you smile, you walk into the office, you smell toasted bread. What does that remind you of? Oh, <laughs> exactly. How does that feel? It's simple. It, it's those really simple things that come intuitive. You feel good about it, then why not do it? What feels intuitive sometimes is really good. So promote those small things in your office. And along the way, if the management is aware of such behaviors and their value, it will automatically scale down everywhere. Okay, I talk a lot. I talk uh, too much about things that I'm passionate about. Feel free to contact me at any point in time. Uh, feel free to reach out after the talk or reach out to me. In, I'll keep some business cards somewhere here. You can take them or you can reach out to me at, at any point in time.